Good afternoon. I'm so happy to see so many of you here. I'm Claire Brindis. I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And I want to just do a brief introduction to what the Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture is, introduce you very briefly to Sam Hoggett, our Chancellor, and who in turn will introduce to you our speaker this afternoon. The Chancellor Series was initiated in 2006 by Chancellor Mike Bishop with the um, support of uh, Steve Schroeder. And it was really to highlight the importance of health policy to the issues that UCSF confronts and the work that we do every day. Whether you're a clinician, a researcher, working with our community partners, training, all of the above are issues that intersect with the complexity of health policy. And we thought that this series would be very important to bring leaders, key leaders in the field, who could give us some of their insights and wisdom around some of these issues and then for us to think about how UCSF intersects with these issues. I'm really delighted that Sam Hoggett is our chancellor and he's been extremely supportive of health policy on our campus and supportive of our institute. And I must say that as a leader in the field, um, his life has been very much intersected with health policy as well. Many of you know that he began his career as a fellow researcher in 1982, becoming an internationally renowned researcher in the area of um, neonatology and doing groundbreaking research which has enabled thousands and millions of lives to be saved. And of course, we always think about health policy and who can help to pay for access to those services, whether it's in the US or internationally. Sam um, was also the chair of pediatrics and then became dean in our school of medicine. Um, and then most recently, his newest leadership hat is in the area of being the chancellor. And as many of you know, he's been a phenomenal leader. And uh, under his uh, leadership, we have seen a tremendous growth in our campus and a recognition of the importance of bringing the community together with basic science as well as clinical care, as well as groundbreaking research. As a chancellor, uh, Sam oversees the entire $4 billion UCSF enterprise which also includes the top ranking schools in pharmacy, nursing, dentistry, as well as medicine. So it's really with great pleasure that I introduce to you Sam. Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, Claire, thank you for those kind words and thank you for your leadership in, in health policy and other things that you do. Uh, both known to many, but uh, also things that I know about that others don't, so thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today uh, to continue to bring outstanding health policy leaders to the campus uh, in this annual lectureship uh, series uh, to point out the critical role that health policy plays in the lives of our faculty, fellows, residents and students. Um, I don't need to tell you all that, that healthcare is at a crossroads. The Affordable Care Act has brought millions of people uh, into uh, the insurance market, which is a terrific thing. Uh, but clearly the, the national conversation is about affordable health care and how can we uh, do more for less? How can we bring down uh, the uh, health care costs? And uh, the speaker that we have today, Mitch Katz, is uh, a leader in this area. Uh, for the few of you in the audience who don't know uh, Mitch, he was the director and health officer of the San Francisco Department of Health here for 13 years and uh, he's well known for amongst uh, many, many things and I'll just uh, highlight a few of the areas that he championed and actually implemented incredibly successfully during his tenure here in San Francisco. Uh, the uh, funding of the needle exchange, uh, creating Healthy San Francisco, outlawing the sale of tobacco at pharmacies, uh, winning ballot measures for the rebuilding of Laguna Honda Hospital uh, and San Francisco General Hospital, or as we uh, now call it, after the uh, just terrific ribbon cutting uh, a week or so ago, the Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. Um, so just rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> um, I was at the ribbon cutting and, and then at a, a dinner celebrating the opening of the hospital. 
uh, and it, it was just terrific. Um, the sense of uh, pride and, and, and passion, and uh, I'm, I'm just delighted that we have uh, the uh, current and past leadership of San Francisco General here to celebrate uh, that occasion and to hear Mitch talk, and Mitch, uh, it wouldn't have happened without Mitch's leadership uh, in and around the effort on the, on the ballot and many other things, so personal thank you for that, Mitch. Uh, Mitch then, uh, sadly, uh, left San Francisco uh, about five years ago for LA County uh, to direct the Los Angeles Department of Health Services. Um, a huge job, in fact, the second largest public safety net system in the United States. Uh, in his five years at the, uh, uh, in, in LA, he created an ambulatory care network, impaneled over 350,000 patients to a primary care home, eliminated uh, the quite extraordinary debt that he inherited when he went there through increased revenues and decreased uh, administrative expenses, and he implemented uh, a new electronic uh, health system across the system. Uh, his success uh, just brought him more work, and he is now the director of the newly created Los Angeles County Health Agency, an agency that uh, has brought together the Department of Health Services, public health, and mental health for LA County, providing uh, integrated care. Uh, and in his new job, Mitch oversees a budget of $7 billion a year and has 28,000 employees. In this new role, he's moved over 1,000 medically complex patients from hospitals and emergent departments into independent housing, eliminating unnecessary and very expensive hospital care, and giving patients, uh, even more importantly, the dignity of their own home. Uh, despite that workload, he continues to see patients every week as an outpatient physician at Roy Bile Comprehensive Health Center, and he sees patients on the inpatient medicine service um, at uh, LA County Hospital and Harbor UCLA Medical Center and all of you, UCLA Medical Center. I gave up clinical care when I became dean, so uh, I don't know how you do it, Mitch, but uh, congratulations. And of course, uh, we can call Mitch one of our own, uh, having uh, uh, the fact that he did his residency here at UCSF. So it's a personal pleasure uh, to welcome Mitch back to San Francisco to give uh, this year's Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture. Hey everyone, uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's already been a, a spectacular day because I've seen uh, so many people um, that uh, I grew up with. I, I sort of think of this as where I grew up, um, starting from the only reason that I, I'm in, uh, I was here in San Francisco uh, for residency is because I met Steve Schroeder. He interviewed me and I thought I'd like to work for him. Um, and that was why I left the East Coast, where I, I'd never been, like many East Coast people, I'd never been west of the Mississippi. I never really considered the idea of being west of the Mississippi um, until I met Steve. Um, and uh, just an amazing you know, number of years. And I'm just so grateful that so many of you who I worked with in the San Francisco Department of Public Health, who I did residency with, who were my mentors, uh, that you all saw to come to the talk means so much to me. So thank you for doing that. Um, uh, I wanna talk about how health departments um, can help to spark policy change. I think that it often turns out that in the local area, you can do things that you can do in broader stages, um, and then by doing it, you can make the broader change happen. Uh, it's a model of change that, that I found to be incredibly successful over time. Uh, so the uh, first example uh, I thought would be a very San Francisco example, which is needle exchange. And those of you like me who have gray hair will remember back to how awful the 80s and the 90s were for those of us who were living and working here, and even more so for those of us who were taking care of people. Those were the, the horrible years of the epidemic. Uh, 1991 was the year that AIDS became the number one cause of death among men in San Francisco. 
right? I mean, the, the number of friends, colleagues we all lost as people who lived and worked here, it, it was a horrible time. Clearly the goal was to prevent new infections because at this time this was before any of the very good treatments were available. So what you do want to do is prevent infections. So an early you know, observation, not mine, and that will be a continuing theme I, that, that to do great work, you don't have to have any good ideas. You just have to implement other people's good ideas. Um, and the world is filled with good ideas that have yet to be implemented. So there's a, a lot of, of world change that can occur. So cities that had needle exchange uh, programs had much lower rates of HIV infection among injection drug users. Uh, so, uh, and people understood, so not only was the, the data, but there was the common sense idea that a user would always prefer a clean needle compared to a dirty needle. Why? Because a clean needle is sharper. So all you have to do is get the clean needle in the user's hand and they'll use the clean needle. So San Francisco had, in fact, a needle exchange program. It was underground at the time. Um, the police were looking the other way. Um, but the problem was that there wasn't enough funding to sustain the program. The demand for needles was too great and it was too hard to, to fundraise uh, because in fact the donations were not tax deductible because it was all an illegal activity. What made it illegal was that under California law, syringes could only be dispensed with the doctor's prescription. So since that was our paraphernalia law, it couldn't be a nonprofit. And the challenge that I faced was how can you publicly fund something that's an illegal activity? Right. And yet you know that to do that if you could, you could save lives. So the solution turned out to be that state law does allow counties to suspend laws in cases of public health emergency. And this too became a theme of my implementation career, which is just because someone tells you something's illegal doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you have to be perhaps a little more creative, you have to find a law in the other way. Um, so this particular state law, of course, had nothing to do with needle exchange. It had nothing to do with HIV. It's a simple law that you can all understand. If there's an earthquake in San Francisco, you don't want your government to be following its rules about competitive bidding. No, you want whatever bulldozer you know, can move the rubble quickly hired, right? So you need a way to waive those laws. Okay, so this is the way, but it had nothing to do with needle exchange. But you see, the goal was to fund needle exchange and not get arrested, right? That was the goal, right? So it seemed to us that this provision was sufficient that the then Republican Attorney General Lundgren, who was a conservative and who opposed needle exchange, would feel that he couldn't successfully take us to court. That was the goal. Um, so the San Francisco Board of Supervisors declared a public health emergency. Uh, the mayor signed the bill, and I'll never forget uh, watching uh, then Mayor Frank Jordan, who was quite brave about it, a former police chief. He's reading the memo from the county council, and he gets through the part that says um, that he could be arrested, that we could all be arrested. He gets to the part where it says, and anyone who implements this in elect, as an elected official may not be able to run again for any political office, right? And I see like the pause, right? Because it's one thing to tell an elected official that they might get arrested and another to tell them they can't run again for any political office. But he, he was a good guy, Frank. He, this was not his issue, but he understood that people's lives were at stake and he went for it. Um, so needle exchange was, was funded. Now, now the story doesn't end here, right, because the point of this talk, right, is to say how, as a laboratory, you can make broader policy change. So the uh, board uh, renewed the public health emergency every two weeks for nine years, right? Which should give you some sense of how ridiculous this was, right? Because how could you have an emergency that lasted 
um, nine years. But meanwhile, during that time, we exchanged two million dirty needles for two million clean needles. We prevented, you know, a uncalculable amount of HIV, hepatitis B, and now we know we saved an amazing number of lives because of hepatitis C, which then we would have called non-A, non-B hepatitis. We didn't even know um, they were doing that. In 1999, and I want you to look closely at what the bill we got was. Uh, because it's, it's pretty funny. We got a bill that allowed counties to establish needle exchange programs if they declare an emergency, right? Is that not ridiculous? That here we made this up. We really did. We made it up so that we would not ha give them grounds to arrest us. And then they turn around and approve needle exchange as long as the county declares an emergency. So then all these other counties declared an emergency and then went on to fund needle exchange. It wasn't until 2011 that California passed a law allowing needle exchange programs without an emergency order. And uh, to this day, you cannot use a federal nickel to fund needle exchange, even though there's no question of its efficacy. There was a brief moment when you could have. Uh, so it did turn out that they briefly in 2009 allowed it and then the backlash, it went away. So this, in some ways, this was my crucible experience. Um, it, I've never, in some ways, it was better and broader than any other experience uh, that I've had since. But it, when you tell me uh, in my current job that I can't do something, in my head, I always think, well, if you could fund needle exchange when it's against the law, I don't know that you can't do it. You're gonna to have to convince me that you can't do it. So, um, uh, since I came to San Francisco, you know, of course, all my examples are about sex and drugs, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take any meaning from that. Um, but uh, another, uh, I'm gonna to switch to a more clinical example to show that, that the changes that you might make can be really big or they can be really small, but they, they nonetheless can have a major impact on real people. True life clinical problem that though any of us who see patients who have sexually transmitted diseases know, which that it can be very hard to get the partners to come in. And that's especially been true if you're taking care of a woman, you can't get her male partner to come in. Now, if he doesn't get treated, she's gonna get reinfected, right? You already know that, it's unavoidable. You know in those instances how she got infected and you know that if he doesn't get treated, your treatment of her is not going to make any difference. Unfortunately, there is, an, uh, at that time, a act that said that prescription of antibiotics uh, by a physician without examining the patient was against the law. So again, we're confronting a law that really doesn't make any difference. So having been recently off my needle exchange example, we went looking for a law that could be used to the opposite effect. And so it turns out that the health and safety code does authorize the local health officer, who happened to be me, to take all necessary measures to prevent the transmission of infectious diseases. Well, there's no question sexually transmitted uh, diseases are infectious. So let's, let's use that as our reasoning. Um, let's collect a little data, because while uh, research is not, in my opinion, often sufficient to bring policy change, it helps to bring policy change, right? So the mistake is to think if we do it just, if we do this great study, the world will change. In my experience, that doesn't usually happen just because of the study. But having the study, very helpful. Uh, the, the corollary, which is um, maybe a little bit cynical, is that in my experience delivering research I, I, to policymakers, I wouldn't say that the standard of you know, a journal, you know, the high standards, I'll just say you know, the Journal of Internal Medicine. What, what policymakers often want to know is, does it work? If I say, look, it works, and here's the data, that, that's often sufficient. Nobody is looking to see you know, whether or not you, you got into the highest priority journal or not. We did a little study. 
So we called STD clients who received the partner packets that we had arranged now that we had found a way around the, the uh, rule. 73% of partners took treatment, 57% of the couples discussed STDs. You might say, where's my control group? I had no control group. I didn't, I didn't have a control group. I went and said, look, we've been, all of the clinicians look at these numbers and they say they are so much higher than what we were able to get before, right? And people looked at it uh, and agreed that they were compelling. But I knew that I could, that in and of itself was not going to cause the policy change. What I needed was some way of getting the medical establishment involved. Because medical establishment is always viewed as the standard of community practice. So if I wanted this accepted as community practice, I needed the group. So who is the group? Well, fortunately, again, I live in San Francisco. So the group is the San Francisco Medical Society, which you might imagine or know yourself from membership is a very progressive group of physicians. So I brought it to them uh, and asked them to support partner treatment, and they did almost overwhelmingly. Uh, and part of why I knew they would the reason I needed them to do it, I knew they would have no power. No one, was gonna, no one at the state level would care that the San Francisco Medical Association supported it. I needed the CMA. The CMA is a constituent group. That is to say, it values that it supports its chapter's work. So the chance of getting something passed if, the, if a chapter brings it is so much higher than if I brought it. And in fact, when we brought it to the CMA, it passed by one vote. We got like 52% of the votes. But of course, it didn't matter what percent of the votes I got. I got to say, look, the CMA has endorsed this change in policy. Uh, so uh, once I got them uh, to uh, the Society for San Francisco and CMA, here's the, the laws we got. And again, like the other, I'll ask you to, to read carefully what I got. In 2001, SB 648 authorizes physicians and mid-level practitioners to prescribe partner antibiotic therapy for chlamydia. Say for chlamydia, you were talking about STDs. Why'd you, why'd you narrow it to chlamydia? You know, what about gonorrhea? Gonorrhea could be easily treated with a partner packet. It doesn't need an injection. And the answer is it got redlined right out of the bill. Right out of the bill, the red line went through and gonorrhea. Turns out that legislators don't like talking about gonorrhea. <laughs> gonorrhea has a different socioeconomic status than chlamydia. If you look at, at the epidemiology of chlamydia, um, much more middle class, more commonly among Caucasians than gonorrhea, which is overwhelmingly you know, among people of color and lower income. I could not get it through. The, apparently the legislators who knew that chlamydia, you know, cause of fertility, I think they imagined that their granddaughters, their daughters might not be able to produce the progeny. They passed the law, but poor gonorrhea got read out. Now, at that time when this happened, did I go and complain? Did I yell at them and say, what do you mean you've, you've ruined my bill? No, of course not. I went and said, this is terrific. Thank you so much. I am so appreciative. This will make such a big difference. And then after the dust had settled and the law went through and no harm went, uh, Mark Leno carried in 2006 uh, the bill that allowed us to do gonorrhea. And for those of you who are part of the uh, more the, the scientific part of the community, New England Journal published in 2005 an article that showed that the chance of recurrence of STD was less when uh, the person who was infected was given um, a packet of treatment or an expedited appointment. Uh, and uh, then brings me to yet another sort of generalizable lesson that I try for people who are interested in research. There are a variety of ways to do research. Um, the model that I was certainly taught was that you do research first, and then you use the research to support the policy change. But sometimes it turns out that it's easier to do the policy change and then do the research just to make sure you really did make the right policy call. It isn't always in the linear way um, that we were taught. 
Um, so again, staying on, you know, sort of San Francisco lessons, um, long after the HIV test was licensed, which was 86, we still have all these people who don't know that they're infected, right? And because they don't know they're infected, they can't get treatment. There are lots of reasons why people don't learn they're infected. We can't change all of the reasons, but I was at this point particularly focused on one, which was the written consent. And again, those of you who worked in those clinical years will remember that piece of paper that you had, that you had to get the patient to sign the piece of paper. Now, while that may not sound like much, I always imagine the, the low-income person, perhaps someone who's, had, who's been disenfranchised over their life, has not had good opportunity, not good medical experience, they're in the hospital bed. You've done innumerable, unspeakable things to them. Right, you've taken their blood at 3 a.m., you've wheeled them for x-rays, you've explained practically nothing. Then all of a sudden you arrive in their room with this piece of paper and say you'd like to do this test. You know, wouldn't you wonder why all of a sudden there is this consent to sign? Might you not, you know, quit doubt whether or not you really should sign that consent? Um, so I did a little bit of investigation, and here too, I think there's a valuable lesson in people wanting to make policy. I had always thought that that test was required, that piece of paper was required in law. No, it turned out that what the law said was that people had to consent for the test, which of course is entirely right that people have to consent for an HIV test. It was the lawyers who invented the form to protect the hospitals from liability. The question was not whether or not the patient had to sign the form, the question was how would the hospital protect itself for, against liability if the person felt like they shouldn't have been tested. That was the whole basis of the form. So once we realized that, we realized, well, then we don't need the form, and having the best laboratory in the world was this SFGH, right, a hospital that's always been focused on what is right for the patient, right, not, as, not what is right to minimize risk, but how do you save lives. So we eliminated the written consent for HIV testing in the San Francisco system, and here's what happened. Not only did the number of tests go up, but the number of positive tests go, went up. So we identified a bunch of people who now were eligible for treatment. And treatment by this point, which is life-saving, right? Uh, obviously in the earlier years, when there was no effective treatment, the arguments were very different. So what did we do with that? We, we got past AB 682, which actually changed the standards to what you all do now, which turned out to be a step further than we had gone. Um, the, the step now is that we inform people and we, we give people the right to say, no, I don't want to be tested, but we don't even require, um, we treat it now more like any other test, um, which is that, that people should be told. Um, Tobacco use, uh, Samuel kind enough uh, to mention it. Again, uh, credit to my, to my mentor, Steve. Um, tobacco use remains the number one cause of uh, preventable death in San Francisco, uh, in California, in the US, in the world. Uh, we became the first locality to ban pharmacies from selling tobacco. Uh, to me, you know, I always went when the idea uh, of doing this, and again, was it my idea? No, I haven't shown you anything that was my idea. In this, in this presentation, uh, all of the ideas were other people's ideas. The pharmacists, uh, Joe, our dean is here, uh, they were the ones who said, we don't wanna be selling tobacco. We're pharmacists, we're healthcare professionals, right? We don't want to be engaged in this. Uh, and it had turned out that almost all the independents had stopped selling tobacco, but the Walgreens of the world, the big pharm pharmaceuticals, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't stop doing it. And the thing that irritated me about it, and I might not have even have noticed it myself, were it not, and again, Sam was talking about the changes in healthcare world, right? This began where pharmacies were really trying to convince you that they're your healthcare provider. 
right? Because they're making money on those vaccines they're giving us, the shingles vaccine, the flu vaccine. They want us to come for their, you know, they have nurse practitioners to, to do diagnosis. They're really trying to set them up as healthcare providers, which is not a bad idea, right? Pharmacies are plentiful, people go. But I'm thinking how you can't have it both ways. Right? You want to be the corner store, which is what people argue. Well, how is this any different than people buying the cigarettes in the corner store? To me, it's very different. Right? You want to be a corner store that sells alcohol and cigarettes? Okay, you know, these, are Ill, these are legal purchases in the US, and I'm not convinced that prohibition has been such a successful strategy in this country. Usually just serves to, to send things to the black market. But no, you can't be a healthcare provider with these big signs, we care about your health, and you're selling tobacco, right? It's wrong, it sends the wrong message. Um, so following our doing it, um, Boston, uh, a number of counties around Massachusetts, uh, the city of Richmond passed similar bans. Um, and then you may have noticed in the last year, CVS became the first pharmacy nationally uh, to stop uh, selling tobacco, and maybe there's hope for broader legislation. When CVS did it, the New York Times carried an editorial saying if the other pharmacies are not prepared to stop doing this voluntarily, then Congress has to act. Now, Congress has not acted, and I don't think Congress is going to act on this soon, right? But with all of these things, right, the idea you can't necessarily finish them. The question is what can a local group do um, to make something more likely to happen over uh, a reasonable horizon. So uh, my last couple of examples uh, are going to move into more healthcare delivery. Um, so I, I brought you earlier back in time. Here's a, a shorter way back in time. Uh, 2008, San Francisco. The Clinton's health uh, reform bill had failed. Uh, you'll remember Governor Schwarzenegger had a pretty good bill. It was very similar to the Massachusetts model. It lost by only one vote. And one of the great things, and one of the things that I, I certainly took with me to LA, is we're San Francisco, right? We're different, right? And that was the spirit, you know, certainly of Gavin Newsom and the other, you know, leaders. It's okay, this failed. San Francisco has to do something, right? We didn't know that there would eventually be Obamacare, um, but the, the sense was the state bill has, has failed. We can't just leave it at this. Uh, and uh, all of you know, if only from the surcharges you receive at your restaurant meals, uh, that we formed Healthy San Francisco, which uh, still is the only coverage initiative that I know of that provides health care coverage to the uninsured regardless of income, immigration status, and pre-existing conditions. Uh, as I'll show you, we, we've done a model um, in uh, uh, Los Angeles, uh, but that it, it, doesn't, it has an income threshold. And part of what made Healthy San Francisco great and very San Francisco was it was open to everybody. If you earned more, you paid more. But it didn't, it wasn't restricted, um, or isn't restricted since it still is going on. It wasn't restricted um, to people um, based on income. Um, you know it, what, that it is a uh, pretty comprehensive benefit. Um, it, I got so many fan letters about Healthy San Francisco, and I hope Barbara is still getting them. Uh, the number one group that I would get, you might find interesting, parents. I would get these long letters from parents saying, you know, my daughter's an artist, she just moved to San Francisco, I was so worried about her because she doesn't have health care coverage, and then she told me about Healthy San Francisco, and I, I sleep so much better knowing that she has it. I got all of them with these beautiful set of letters. Um, from uh, parents, and as well as from people who were, who were in it. Um, the, we had uh, data, um, in fact, that showed that most people were satisfied, they would recommend it, and uh, that they felt that their health needs were better met now than before Healthy San Francisco, 41%. And the reason I, I, I always stop there is it more or less was the same providers. 
We didn't write the people were getting care at the same places they always got care. All we did was put a system about it. We didn't change fundamentally the care. They got care at General, they got care at one of the community health centers, Mission Neighborhood, Castro Mission, Southeast. We didn't change any of that. We didn't change the doctors, we didn't change the nurses, we didn't change the pharmacists. What we changed is we made it into a system so that people understood it. They understood what they could get. Um, we found that uh, it increased the percentage of people who had a usual source of care uh, and who, who went for one. Uh, we found that it decreased inappropriate emergency uh, department use, uh, which uh, to our new emergency department chair, you know, I, I want you to know I'm always defending the emergency department. You know, there's, we have, which, which I think is worth doing because there's all this stuff about, you know, in the age of ACA, Right about how you know people shouldn't go to the emergency room. Well, if you have substernal chest pain, you should go to the emergency room, right? Um, and let's stop blaming people who are going to work and who wind up in an emergency room because they didn't have the sick leave to take off during the day to go in their you know regular provider, right? So, but what? But uh, um, still, to the extent that we can eliminate the inappropriate use, it lets you take care of the person who really needs it. Um, we, uh, as we brought in the model, we had a copycat, uh, Howard County, at a particular tense moment in the Obama debate. And remember that that was the, the ACA, which has brought all of these changes without Nancy Pelosi and the 60th vote, which was then lost, I think, just like three weeks later, none of this would have happened. Right, that's how close the margin was to something that has had a huge positive change uh, across California and across the US. Uh, President Obama at one of his rallies on this said, you know, if San Francisco can cover everybody, then surely the federal government can. Um, we were challenged uh, on the employer spending requirements. Uh, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, which we were able to convince not to take the case, and that's what enabled us to keep rolling with uh, Healthy San Francisco. So then I, I moved. Um, uh, I like to think I took the San Francisco sense of urgency, the San Francisco sense of values, of progressive values, of the importance of people receiving good care uh, with me. And uh, I found a system where doctors and nurse practitioners who were very good at caring people, but there was no system, they saw who they saw. So if you went one week, you saw a doctor so-and-so. If you went two weeks later, you saw the NP. Nobody had a patient panel, nobody was in panel to a provider. And if you look at the research, longitudinal care is the thing that consistently comes up as higher quality, lower cost consistently, and every practitioner or patient will tell you why. Because if your primary care provider knows you, they can do a better job than if they don't know you. Um, so uh, here's something I could not have done in San Francisco. I could not have impaneled 350,000 people, right? This is a city, right, uh, where the whole city is about 750,000. Right, healthy San Francisco at its peak, I think was 62,000, right? So, you know, the fun of my work in LA is the need is so huge, right, that you can do things on a scale that were not possible here. Uh, we also have done um, My Health LA, um, which is with our community clinics, which is currently the largest program running anywhere for the residually uninsured. So these are the people left out of the ACA. Currently have 125,000 people who have a connection to a primary care provider um, who are otherwise uninsured. Um, so the, the amazing thing about LA is, is the numbers. So I, I'm gonna come to my last example um, which is, uh, as you'll see, very, uh, very much a, a UCSF example because of my colleague. Um, so the problem that he and I were trying to solve is unacceptably long waits for specialty care in Los Angeles. So they told me when I came 
I had to do something about specialty care because the average wait time to see a cardiologist was nine months. So I said, well, you know, I don't know much about your system yet, but I know that's not good. If it really, if that's really the best that the system can do, then don't make appointments, right? There's no, there's no useful appointment to make in nine months. If you cannot make a prompt appointment, then please stop making appointments. Let's just agree that at the moment we don't have cardiology and we'll have to function as internists to deal with it, but, but do not make appointments in nine months, and part of why I, I, as someone who had studied these kinds of issues at, at general that I knew, is guess what happened in nine months? No one showed, right? So is this not the perfect world? We, we have no access, we can't provide you an appointment, but we have miserable productivity because nobody ever shows. So we have all these doctors who go to their clinics where no patients ever show, um, but at the same time, we say, you know, we're so overworked, we're so busy, we don't have any appointments in nine months. So I said, you can't do that. No more nine-month appointments. Um, it, it also, that would have precluded us from even participating in the ACA because California is a managed care model, and the managed care model requires that you provide access within 30 days to specialty care. So if my system says it takes nine months to get a cardiology appointment, I can't participate. So the answer, and I said UCSF because it was, this is all how ye, um, a, a former UCSF professor and, and uh, chief uh, medical officer at SFGH, who we like to say invented e-consult in his garage. So Hal invented e-consult to deal with GI gastrointestinal disease consults when he was the head of the GI service at SFGH, and then he broadened it. When he said to me, well, I think that's what we have to do um, for uh, Los Angeles, I'm like, Hal, do you know how many consults there are here? I mean, in San Francisco, we just had one acute care hospital, we, we had our 11 community clinics. We did not include the private community clinics in the e-consult. I'm like, politically, we'll have to include the private clinics. We'll never do it, it'll never. And he's like, there's nothing wrong with the basic model. It should work, and I, I'm certainly not one who would discourage you know, someone from trying really hard to make something happen. Um, so indeed, uh, today our e-consult system is running on 60 specialty services. We have 420 reviewers. Um, we have 3,700 submitters. That's 3,700 different doctors or nurse practitioners from somewhere in our system submitting e-consults. Um, at 407 sites, including sites like the jail um, and uh, public health, we're currently running 14,000 consults a month. Uh, we respond on average in 2.9 days. Um, so I have no access issue and I worked out with the state as is appropriate that the e-consult counts because the e-consult is not an algorithm. It is, it is read by whatever your field is. A cardiologist reads the cardiology one, GI specialist, so it, because it's a real person and not an algorithm, it counts as meeting uh, the standard. Um, and then uh, what we've we found uh, consistently as we've done it, no matter what specialty, is about 24%, so basically a quarter of the consults do not require a visit. So all of those visits, right, if you sort of think about this from a system point of view, I have a huge backlog. I'll never be able to hire enough specialists, right? What do I do? Well, this means that a quarter of those visits never happen. It's all closed via the e-consult because the cardiologist said bump up the ACE inhibitor, right? The, uh, the nephrologist said start a ARB drug, right? So, and then this also underestimates the efficiency because what I can't tell you, it's not done as a research method, but we know anecdotally, is that the visits are all of much higher quality. So a, a gastroenterologist may say, I can't evaluate your patient for hepatitis treatment until you do a viral load so that I can see if the hepatitis C really is still active. 
right? Because you could have an antibody response but not have a positive hepatitis C viral load. Without e-consult, that's what he or she would say the first visit, right? So under the old, our old system, assuming the patient actually went, the doctor would write, you know, hepatitis C, refer to liver clinic. Liver clinic would see the patient, they'd see, oh yes, the antibody test was done, but no viral load test was done, and they'd have to say, okay, to the patient, okay, well, I'm sending you for a viral load test, come back in two weeks, and then based on that, we'll know whether or not you're eligible for treatment. In any consult system, you don't need, need that. So I'm gonna end, and this is my last slide, because uh, uh, on policy change is, so this is working really great. This has transformed my system. This has enabled me to participate. Is this gonna sweep the country? Not under the current payment system, it won't. There is no, even though everybody who has interacted with our system would agree it's better for the patients, right? They don't have to go to unnecessary visits for long transportation time, or their initial visit is more useful. It's better for the primary care doctor because I'm a smarter doctor because I send these consults and then the pulmonologist teaches me something and the rheumatologist teaches me something and the next time I don't have to ask them because I already know the answer. It's better for the specialist because they're seeing the patients they really wanted to see to do it, but you can't do it on a fee-for-service system. It doesn't work. You can't do it under Medicare. Um, there's no, there, right now while there is a CPT code that you can um, code it as, there's no payment for it. So there's, there's no possibility of doing it. So the only way, the only reason I can do it is because I have all salaried physicians and I'm in a system that is mostly capitated and for the good of all of us, I just take a loss on the few Medicare people or private insurers who I can't bill for it. It doesn't matter because it saves me so much money and it lets me you know, succeed as a provider. But unless you make some change, it, there's nothing that, that would preclude it. I don't know some of the specialty lobbyists may or may not be happy because you know, I noticed from my parents who go to Medicare providers that you know, a, full vi a full examination and lab test always occurs, right? And I always explain to them, well, that's because that's how you get the higher billing code, right? It's not fraud if they, it doesn't matter whether you need all those things, as long as they do all those things, they get paid. So you know, the, this work never ends. It's just a question of how you can take you know, these successes, which I think public health departments are very good at generating because so often we have more flexibility. We can solve problems that are too big to be solved on the macro level. And then the question comes, can we get the other systems in the case of e-consult um, to broaden those solutions? So thank you very much. I'd like to open it up for some questions and then we'll repeat the question because we are taping. So the, the question is, what is the wait time? In some of our specialties, we now basically have no wait time. Uh, in other words, people get appointments within a week or two. Uh, I, I think, I don't know every single specialty, but uh, the, the other feature of the consult now is that unlike the previous version, if the person does need to be seen within two weeks, the cardiologist can say, this person has to be seen in two weeks, which we didn't, since the old system, all we had was the C cardiologist, there was no prioritization. So everybody now will get, get seen, and if you, although we, we tell people not to do emergency e-consults, if the specialist thinks it's an emergency after they read it, they'll arrange for an appointment the next day. Does the waiver uh, or what other efforts are we making to resolve this? So we, we, the waiver, as it stands now, does not resolve it, uh, but we are talking to, to CMS to get them to resolve it. But it and, and I don't think that, that it would be right to say there's necessarily opposition, but change is hard, right? And they, before they will issue any rules, I'm sure they will consult a variety of groups, including specialists. And again, you can see in my system, where everybody is salaried, 
right? The doctors are very happy to, to do the consult. In fact, I would say it's enhanced the quality of their lives because what I would do is say, uh, people, I would take, a, I would drop a session in exchange for reading the consults, right? Which then gave many doctors, uh, or some, in some cases, the nurse practitioners who do the, the readings, gave them a, another session that's flexible because I, I can answer any consult on my iPhone, right? So people could, got a session, if you will, off from the Monday through Friday scheduling. If they were doing enough, they do it in the evenings and weekends. But again, it's salary, they're not being paid, right? So when it comes, I mean, I think the issue the, that, that some people might raise is, let's say you're a urologist. Well, the, the amount of money that it would be sensible to get paid for doing any consult is not going to be the amount of money that it would be sensible to be paid for doing a whole history and physical uh, and lab test. Now, the question is, what, does the patient really need that? But almost none of our billing refers to that. Right, I mean, all of our, our billing systems are, you know, to the extent that they're, they're focused at all, they're focused on preventing fraud, making sure that if you charge for those nine elements of the urologic exam, that you have a note to defend that you did the nine units of the urologic exam. Not the question of, in the case of, of my father, not to be too graphic, but whether a 92-year-old man really needs a testicular exam, right? It's, if, you, if you have to, you know, if that has to be part of the exam to get billed, then you're gonna do that exam. So that, that's why it may be an issue. You know, the, I'm a, a very upbeat, optimistic person. There's nothing that makes me as discouraged about this country as gun control. I feel like we're like the, the, the reasonable person who just has this huge like hole in, in our thinking, right? Like, you know, not to say that we're all perfect, but it, it's so hard for me to understand uh, the country's uh, re response around issues of the free access to guns. So I think it's a public health issue. Um, I, don't, I don't see, sadly, much hope, though, for immediate political change. Uh, I don't think that you're gonna see any gun control. I mean, you'll, you'll see people like you and, and me. Lucy circulated, I remember, a petition at the, at the last time there was a massive shooting. I don't, but I don't believe change is gonna happen on that one. I have a new passion. Uh, so we, we took over uh, jail health. And if you want an example of something that across our country is so wrong and expensive, um, you've got to look into what's going on in jail health. So in LA, uh, jail, there were 16,000 people in the LA County Jail at any given time. Uh, just to remind people, jail is different than prison. Um, jail is generally short term, includes about a third of the people in jail haven't been convicted of a crime, they're just poor, they can't make bail. There's nothing to do with the crime they've committed, it's that they're poor. The part of jail that I wanna work on is the 35% of the people in the LA County Jail have a mental illness severe enough that they're on antipsychotics, right? So, you know, I'm not talking minor, right. Those are people we've already detected. And, and now that I've started working myself clinically in the jail, Deb, I mean, it's heartbreaking. I'm looking at these people and I'm thinking, they belong in a mental hospital, right? What possible good is keeping this person in jail? Uh, in LA, the cost of, the custodial cost of the LA County Jail, not counting medical care, is $130,000 a year. Um, there is nothing that you could not provide, and it's 100% general fund, because you can't, even if the person's eligible for Medicaid, right, none of this is reimbursable. On the other hand, if I put them in a mental hospital, depending upon the level and whether it's an IMD or not an IMD, I can get paid. So I'm gonna to try to spend a lot of time in the next couple of years really looking at how many people you can divert out of jail who, have, who are these people with a serious mental illness where you know that the only chance that they have, also those with addiction, the only chance that they have of not continuing the same pattern is if you got them into treatment. Um, and what I wanna see, and it's a lot of what m my work in the LA has been about is scale. So again, diversion wasn't my idea. 
There are a number of communities that are doing diversion quite well. Nobody with the jail with 16,000 people in it, right? So, so the question becomes, if we say that there are 16,000 people, and just to, just to boggle your mind on some of the challenges, 1,100 people come and go from the LA County Jail every day. So imagine what that's like for discharge planning, for those of you who've tried to do it right from a hospital. 11, oh, and by the way, you don't know when they're gonna leave, right? Because when they leave depends upon the court date and the court finding. But if we say, that means at this moment, there are 4,000 people incarcerated in jail with a mental illness severe enough that they're on an antipsychotic medication. So could I get those 4,000 people released into <coughs> mental health treatment? And depending on the person, that doesn't mean they couldn't eventually either serve time if that's in somebody's purpose, they can wear ankle guards. I mean, they're the, the issues can be dealt with from a security point of view, and most of these are not serious uh, crimes. The last thing I'll mention is, because uh, public health focuses a lot on disparities in treatments, and you had mentioned it, can't see a white guy there. Walk up and down the halls, everybody's black and brown, right? So, you know, you talk about the levels of disparities in this country, usually we're talking about, you know, it's. 10% higher, it's 20% higher. But we in this country, you know, now as a country, we incarcerate a higher percentage of our proportion than any country in any point in history ever has. And everybody agrees it's a failure. For the first time, we have allowed 19 people who have, whose mental illness is so severe that they cannot stand trial. So forget that they're on antipsychotics. They can't stand, they cannot go to trial because they cannot distinguish right from wrong or understand a court proceeding. They therefore languish in jail because they can't be released because they can't go before the judge. So they can be in jail for nine months for a crime that if they got before a judge would have a two week sentence, but they can't get before a judge. Um, so we, for the first time now, have 19, and again, this is my thing about scale, because what's 19 when you have 16,000 people in jail? But for the first time, we have 19 of these people in the community getting treatment. And what made the difference was the agency, because mental health was always prepared to provide them mental health treatment outside the jail, but they had no housing. My department, Health Services, I had made a major push about doing housing, uh, supportive housing, and I was providing supportive housing, and I was happy to, as soon as I heard the issue, I said, well, you know, I'll provide the housing for those, for those people. So I was doing the housing, mental health was providing mental health services, and these people were languishing in jail. And the only way that you get them out is by the two departments recognizing that if we could work on the same people, we could free them. And so now we have 19 and we're evaluating another 20. So it, the, on a micro level, it's also true that if you needed services from out three departments, you'd have to do three different eligibilities. You'd have to fill out three different registrations and that they don't, even though the county is the, the payer at the end, no matter what, how it all rolls out, each department has slightly different interpretations of we'll accept this form for income, no, we won't accept this form for income, we'll accept this form for how many people in your family, oh no, we wouldn't, and so we'll have it in one, we'll come to some common agreement. So again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch, for a really outstanding lecture, and I am very pleased that we've had an opportunity to tape it today. It will be on the IHPS website, and happy to advertise when it's available. Thanks so much.